The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. They got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We were unable to record this on Sunday, and since this is normally the occasion where I give the State of the Parish address, I felt it important that people who weren't able to be in church yesterday had at least the opportunity to get my sense of not necessarily the details that I normally share of what's going on in the life of the church, which usually takes twice as long, as much as how our story is woven into our sacred story as it seems to be so perfectly week after week. And with that, I'll begin. If you have ever watched The Deadliest Catch or seen any show depicting the life of fishermen, you quickly realize it is not easy work. Perhaps you marvel at their toughness, their very specific knowledge and skill that allows them to adapt to often very quickly changing circumstances. Their knowledge and their attention to their environment, the wind, the tide, reading elements of the water and wildlife that would go unnoticed by most, they know better than anyone where the fish or crabs or whatever catch will be. And they're willing to set out in the bitter cold at night, early in the morning, when most of us are comfortably still in our beds to do what they must do. And if they're unsuccessful, there are consequences. An empty hall has financial ramifications for them and for those that depend on them. And a mistake or poor judgment could have an even more dire outcome. This isn't fishing like you may picture when you let your mind go fuzzy. It's not an on-golden pond intergenerational scene where catching fish is secondary to just being together on the boat. It's also worth noting that in the first century, under Roman rule, fishing became a very difficult industry with very thin margins. Taxation had made the vocation, very difficult to eke out a a reasonable living for your family. And the Sea of Galilee was heavily fished. And as I said, the catches were taxed to the hilt. When I was over in that area, we went to the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Gennesaret, for the Hebrew word for harp, because that's the shape of the sea. 
We even enjoyed the tilapia of that area, often called the St. Peter fish. And the guide pointed out the best places for fishing, both now and 2,000 years ago. And they explained why, that unlike most lakes, there is a path that the water travels in and out of the sea. And the fish follow the area, and they also depend on feeding areas. And this was the place where people were most likely to catch fish and where their nets could scrape the bottom and make sure the fish had no escape when they were corralled. All this to say, fishermen now and most certainly then knew what they were doing. They knew every cubic foot of that lake, every inch. Everything depended on it. But they had fished all night and caught absolutely nothing. One can only imagine how disheartened they were as they approached the shore. And I can't help but think they were just hoping nobody would be there to meet them. That it would be a quiet morning along the shore where they could quietly take their nets, clean them, put them away, and sneak back home throw on their pajamas and curl up in bed and sleep off all that anxiety and disappointment and frustration, but no such luck. What do they find when they get to the shore but a huge, huge crowd so large that Jesus is trying to separate himself from them so that he can talk to them. They were massed so tightly that Jesus had to walk into the water and eventually jump onto Peter's boat, to Simon Peter's boat, so that he could talk to them. And as they're quietly going about their work, checking their nets, trying to tune out the large crowd who can't help but notice things didn't go well, I'm sure Jesus' request to push Simon's boat out farther into the water so he could preach from it had to grate on Simon a bit. How long are you going to be, Jesus? You know, I can't go home until the boat is safely back on shore. But who wants to publicly say no to Jesus? So he nods, and he helps get the boat situated. Then he goes back to his task, sort of half listening, if not just to see when Jesus is winding things up a bit. And if Jesus is like most preachers, just when you think he is near the end, just when you think that this is the final point, the conclusion, he falls back into more. He just keeps going. But then Jesus does finish. And Simon walks over to help get the boat back to shore, and that's all put away, and the pillow's so close at hand, he can even feel it. And Jesus shouts, again in front of everybody, Hey! Why don't you go back and give it another whirl? Go try over there in the deep water. At this point, Peter's dentist is concerned. He is grinding his teeth to dust. Well, Jesus, carpenter turned preacher and now expert fisherman, because A, we've been fishing all night and caught absolutely nothing. And we just barely got our nets put away. And B, because we are absolutely exhausted and really, really, we just want to go home. Or maybe C, it is absolutely the wrong time of day and it is certainly the wrong place to have any luck catching fish. Our nets won't even be able to make it to the bottom for us to scoop up under any fish that might accidentally happen to be where you're pointing. Please just leave the fishing to us. But since you asked in front of all of these people, okay, we'll give it one try. Please hear Simon Peter's skepticism, his fatigue, his lukewarm willingness. This is not an act of profound faith. This is not a bold response. This is as much as anything an opportunity to teach this Jesus to stay in his own lane. We know, 
we just heard how this story ends. There are so many fish that the nets are stretched to near breaking. The boat struggles to stay afloat. Two boats struggle to stay afloat as he calls his friends to help bring that haul to shore. And then in that moment, Peter feels all of it. All of his contempt, his doubt, and it all wells up as guilt, as unworthiness. He tells Jesus that he is not worthy of this haul, of this miracle, of Jesus' attention. And then what does Jesus do? He says, you're hired. Come follow me. And we will fish for people. And in that moment, and in that moment, everything fades away. It might be a little dramatic license from Luke, but he just leaves all of those fish that the tax collectors are eyeing ever so carefully along the shore. And he walks away. Not just from the largest haul of his life, but from everything that he knew. So I've been thinking about this past year. This story has had so many resonances. I've been exhausted. We've been worn down. This has called us to walk at least a few steps from everything we've known about parish ministry. We entered 2021 having had to cancel our attempts at an outdoor Christmas service because of rain. And in one of the lower moments of my ordained life on Christmas Eve, I preached to my iPhone and a handful of poinsettias. And with the winter weather, we had entirely suspended our in-person worship, even outdoors, and we're virtual again. And without the normal level of activity, ministry leaders were more exhausted by the uncertainty, by the not doing and not leading, than by leading their teams. Then Lent brought with it warmer weather. And we were able to again gather outdoors, now in the back parking lot, a lot closer to our spiritual home, but still so far away. And by Holy Week, thanks to Bob Irving, who we're indebted to for this and a myriad of things, we had our regathering plan approved by the diocese and even held a couple of our Holy Week services inside this church. Easter was still outside, or I should say Easter Day was still outside, but that didn't dampen our spirits. It was so wonderful to see so many of you gathered out in the back parking lot. We brought Easter joy and our alleluias right there to the blacktop. And by the following Sunday, we were back in the church for good. Momentum kept building. We were vaccinated. We were so full of hope of what was to come. And I remember the joy of our prayer walk after going through so many of our race and reconciliation discussions online that we were able to be together our two parishes walking the streets of Warrington, and it was supposed to be a silent, meditative walk, but there was so much joy in being together that Father Randolph was unable to quell us. It meant so much to be together. Things continued to swell even through the early summer when we normally retreat. A new and very, very intentional newcomers were showing up Sunday in and Sunday out. And it seemed like baptism was now just part of our weekly ritual. I think we had well over 20 baptisms in a stretch of about 10 weeks. And then we discovered the Delta variant. We pulled back, numbers lagged as masks were reintroduced and less fellowship could take place. We realized our goal of starting the program year at full steam with cafe and in-person Sunday school and our, few mu our full music program just wasn't going to happen. We did commit to make sure our youth groups were able to gather in the fall, which meant so much to them. They'd lost so much over the last two years and what was supposed to be a high school or middle school experience that they would treasure 
And during that vulnerable time, we thought it was important that they have this group that they could lean on. So we did that. And then when they gathered at Verdun in the fall, it was such a beautiful moment to have both our middle school and high school youth group working together on team building activities, on high ropes, just being able to share their lives together. But at that time, we had so many that we weren't seeing week in and week out, month in and month out. We were spending a lot for unseen and some foreseen expenses, repairs to the building. A lot was written nationally that the churches and church leadership were far more exhausted in the second year of COVID than at the very height of the pandemic. We felt worn down unequipped, unworthy of the moment at hand. We felt a lot like Peter. And at time, we were casting our nets, not with zeal or profound faith and enthusiasm, without really much intention or expectation. We were casting nets because that's just what we do. And then the craziest thing happened. Nets began to fill. The school, which had thrived over the past two years, thanks to incredible leadership and the ability to navigate COVID more nimbly, helped bear more of our construction debt, truly living into the spirit of the connected campaign. Folks dug deep to give beyond their pledges. Special gifts, large and small, came in when they were very much needed. And we cast our nets with our annual pledge campaign, unsure what would happen. We didn't have a lot to promise people. So much unknown or just not there yet. And boy, did you all respond. It really did feel like our nets were stretched with plenty. And we finally felt like we were in the financial position to begin our music search in confidence we could sustain that position. And momentum continued to build through Advent and then Christmas. Oh, what joy. What a change from the previous Christmas. That outdoor service replete with live donkeys and children upon children playing every part. 275 plus people gathered on that hill between the playground and the blacktop our church band playing, and Jen Taylor doing a tremendous job of shaping the space into stage and worship area. So much joy and fullness. It felt so rich, as did our indoor services with our beautiful music and a homecoming. People came not only to celebrate that Christ was born, but that this was home. And of course, that was right when Omicron was making its presence felt and the COVID numbers skyrocketed right after Christmas and our numbers went back down. But this time it felt different. We felt equipped and not because of our own expertise or wisdom, not because we knew these familiar waters, but because we felt confident that God was at work that God was guiding us to fish in new waters, deep waters, and God was filling our nets. You know, we're not there yet, but I walk filled with hope that the more closely we follow the one who called Peter, who called Andrew, who called James and John, who calls each one of us by name to follow, who calls us to fish for people, the more we realize that in following closely to our Lord, that anything is possible. That in God's infinite abundance, anything can be realized. In that truth, in that assurance, I'm excited to see where God will lead us. Amen.